Hello, uh, my name is Stephen Little. I'm the Cardiology Training Program Director at Houston Methodist Hospital. Welcome to Houston Methodist DeBakey Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Uh, today we have a special treat. Uh, a few years ago we began the um, uh, tradition of getting our uh, graduating fellows to give uh, Grand Rounds in the spring of their graduating year. So today we're thrilled to have two of our graduating fellows do exactly that. Um, before I give their introductions, uh, just a couple of highlights about how we'd like to interact with the audience. So if you could, um, and it should be somewhere on your screen, there are two ways to interact with us for the question and answer period at the end of this presentation. Uh, one is go to, uh, by the web, you can go to pollev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V.com, enter the word DeBakey and then present your question or your comment. Alternatively, you can text it in at DeBakey, uh, the word DeBakey, to the number 37607, and uh, that'll also get us the questions. So we'll come back to uh, that opportunity at the end. So first off, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, it's Dr. Stephanie Fuentes. Uh, Stephanie is currently a third-year cardiology fellow at Houston Methodist. She graduated from uh, the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Uh, she completed her internal medicine residency here at Houston Methodist, and then we were thrilled that she stayed on here for her cardiology training. She's also going to continue here for a little more time uh, doing clinical electrophysiology. Um, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Fuentes is going to talk to us about repaired tetralogy of Fallot and specifically the EP sequelae. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Dr. Little, for the introduction. The title of my presentation is Repaired Tetralogy of Fallot um, EP sequelae. Uh, we will cover in this presentation the different arrhythmias that we may encounter when we um, take care of these patients. And lastly, um, I'll go over the role of RV's resynchronization in this patient population. You may um, wonder why uh, we should learn about uh, arrhythmias in this patient population. Um, and we know that uh, more adults than children are currently living in, with congenital heart disease um, in the United States. 8 to 10 percent of them um, were born with the trilogy of Fallot. Um, and based on the recent ACHD guidelines, which classifies uh, ACHD patients uh, by anatomy or physiological state, um, the trilogy of Fallot patients uh, fall in the moderate uh, complexity category. And uh, when they have arrhythmias, that automatically puts them in um, at least stage C uh, stage. And lastly, we know that there's not enough ACHD trained cardiologists or electrophysiologists, um, which means that 95% of general cardiologists will be seeing ACHD patients. So it's probably a good idea to learn about EP sequelae of repa um, repaired tetralogy of Fallot. So starting off with atrial arrhythmias, uh, we know that more uh, than 20% of patients with repaired tetralogy of Fallot will develop atrial arrhythmias. Uh, during the first part of their adulthood, up until age of 45 to 55, the predominant atrial arrhythmia is intraatrial atrial tachycardia. Uh, later on in their life, after age uh, 55, atrial fibrillation takes over in prevalence. Um, intraatrial reentral tachycardia is um, a macro reentral tachycardia, sort of like atrial flutter, except the atrial rates are slower. Um, and when one has an intact AV node, this uh, can lead to one to one conduction down to the ventricles, which then would um, lead to hemodynamic instability and it could potentially degenerate to ventricular tachycardia. How um, it is managed, um, apart from pharmacologic agents for both acute and uh, long term uh, control of this arrhythmia, uh, um, the expert consensus of 2014 um, rates ca um, catheter ablation as a class one indications for uh, patients with symptomatic and or drug refractory IRT or focal atrial tachycardia. Um, and this is based on the fact that um, the success rate of, uh, of ablation in uh, this particular arrhythmia in tetralogy of low patients is quite high, it's 81%, and this is based on um, studies from 2000 up until 2011. So presumably it may be higher with the current uh, mapping te uh, technology um, as well as the new catheters that we are using. So let's go over an example of um, this particular arrhythmia. So uh, this 52-year-old uh, man with a, a, who was born with the tragedy of Fallot and underwent complete repair uh, in, at three years of age with a prior CTI flutter ablation um, and who has also um, severe, severely dilated right ventricle, severe PR, pro, uh, proximal main PA stenosis with post uh, dilatation, uh, presented to the emergency room with palpitations and lightheadedness. Um, 
in the uh, emergency room, the EKG show this quite fast, uh, roughly around 250 white complex tachycardia in a regular fashion with a typical right bundle uh, branch morphology, which is a juxtaposition of a one-to-one -one conduction of um, in or IRT or atrial flutter. Um, so he underwent uh, a cardioversion because of hemodynamic instability and subsequently brought to our hospital for further care. Um, he was brought to the to the EP lab where we uh, mapped the right atrium, um, and on the left we can see. Um, um, after induction of, uh, of such atrial flutter that the electricity propagation um, seemed to uh, stem from this area right here which sort of um, was in the lateral right atrium um, uh, close to the IVC and it's sort of in the voltage mapping um, that you can see here on the right uh, corresponds to an area of patchy um, scar. So ablation lesions at this, um, at this site uh, terminate tachycardia acutely um, and thankfully he hasn't had any recurrence of this uh, uh, arrhythmia. So moving on to ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac death prevention, um, we know that the incidence of sudden cardiac death in tetralogy of LO is about 2 to 3% per decade. Um, most of these sudden cardiac death events are due to sustained ventricular tachycardia. The mechanism of this VT most of the time is re-entry and based on st uh, studies uh, we know that it's essentially related to surgical repair um, and they have classified at least four isthmus um, where ventricular tachycardia could, um, uh, could come from and it's from the RVOT patch, uh, from the ventriculotomy side, near the pulmonic valve and the VSD patch. Um, so how do we manage uh, this arrhythmia? So first, we have to determine who the, um, benefits from ICD um, for primary prevention. So in addition to the to the typical or the, the current guidelines for non-ACHD patients um, of primary prevention um, ICD implant, uh, the ACHD uh, 2018 guidelines uh, calls for a class 2A uh, a indication for primary prevention ICD in patients with a challenge of follow with the following risk factors being um, LV systolic or diastolic dysfunction, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, QRS duration of more than 180, um, uh, presence of extensive RV fibrosis by CMR, and inducible sustained VT in electrophysiologic um, study. Um, and this is based on a study in the early 2000s, um, w which at this time was the largest multi-centered um, study. It enrolled 121 patients though. Um, and what they wanted to look at is um, in patients that had um, ICD for either primary prevention or secondary prevention, how many um, ICD shocks they had and what the risk factors of that was. Um, and what they found was that the incidence of um, ICD shocks in patients with a, a primary prevention ICD was 7.7% per year. Um, and in those for sec who had the ICD implant for secondary prevention, it was 9.8% per year. Um, and they found that the risk factors um, that this patient population um, had um, was an LV and diastolic pressure of more than 12, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, if they had a ventricular um, incision compared to a natural incision, a QRS duration of more than 180, um, inducible uh, sustained ventricular tachycardia in an EP study, uh, moderate to severe um, regurgitation, and the longer time um, um, from surgery, um, and if they had a transannular patch. But what they also found was the rate of inappropriate shocks was 5 to 6 percent per year, which is not negligible compared to the incidence of how many or how the frequency of IC appropriate ICD shocks they had. So there has been other efforts to um, elucidate on the sudden uh, cardiac death risk prediction. They have included fr um, things like electrocardiographic uh, parameters like QRS fragmentation um, or invasive electrophysiologic studies um, where they, uh, they looked at the, anat uh, the anatomical isthmuses and the, um, and the conduction velocities through there to restratify patients, and um, even doing personalized compu um, computational cardiac models from cardiac MRI to determine the patients that would um, warrant uh, ICD. Um, they haven't all quite made it to the guidelines, um, but this nice review from um, uh, 2021 in Jack nicely 
organizes a more varied uh, risk, uh, uh, list of risk factors um, that we know from, uh, from all the different studies and to be able to classify them as higher, uh, higher risk, intermediate risk or low risk. The more risk factors that, uh, from this list that we, um, that we have then warrant an ICD implant and the less amount of, uh, of these risk factors um, just warrants annual surveillance. Um, and importantly, in those who are right at the middle or intermediate risk, um, the role of EP study uh, may be helpful uh, to determine who warrants an ICD. So now uh, we sort of know how uh, to risk stratify patients that would need an ICD implant, but we have to now address the ventricular tachycardia that leads to these events. Um, so catheter ablation um, is a, a class one indication as an adjunctive therapy to ICD and drug, ther um, drug is for man managing ventricular tachycardia. A class uh, 2A indication is an alternative to drug therapy, but an ICD cannot be forgotten. No. Um, and this is based on the fact that ablation outcomes, um, at least acutely, is 94%, which is quite high. Um, and so the next question is, what uh, if we address the hemodynamic factors that lead to VT, and in particular uh, for these patient populations, what if we address the pulmonic regurgitation? Um, and this group in France um, in 2021 looked just at that. Um, so in this, um, a observational study of a registry of patients that had tetralogy fellow and ICD implant, they looked um, at 165 patients and 26 of them um, underwent pulmonary uh, valve replacement uh, through the study period and they found that there was a re reduced incidence of ICD shocks um, after pulmonary valve replacement. Some of them did have VT ablation but the uh, highest risk reduction was with pulmonary valve uh, replacement. Most of these patients were with, um, had a surgical approach to the uh, pulmonary valve replacement but as we learned a few weeks ago, transcatheter um, options are available as well. The issue, as you can see here, is that this uh, valve covers a precious uh, territory with, re with, uh, with regards to source of VT, uh, meaning that if we place this um, and this patient and patients develop VT after, then it may be kind of hard to reach um, uh, when wants to um, uh, to address uh, ventricular tachycardia with ablation. Um, so it warrants a little bit more communication between the ACHD and electrophysiologist. Um, so an example to illustrate this is the 64-year-old uh, man with the for uh, fellow who had a blood toxic shunt at age 4 and uh, subsequently had full repair at age 8. Um, as a consequence, he had severe pulmonary regurg uh, regurgitation and um, RV dilation and it was being considered for transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. Um, he came in with sustained ventricular tachycardia required external cardioversion and subsequent single chamber ICD implant. Uh, he was brought to the lab and um, what we found in this voltage map that is uh, showing the RV, RVOT and the, um, the pulmonary artery is that, and we know that red is um, a scar and uh, magenta is like healthy tissue. Well, you can see there's a lot of scar in the, in the RVOT, um, but importantly, there was this channel of, um, um, of con um, right in the in the in the area between the RVOT and the and the pulmonary um, in the pulmonary uh, valve um, where we were able to induce the clinical tachycardia um, and where the the transcatheter pulmonary valve would go so we have uh, uh, ablation lesions uh, at the side of the cortical isthmus terminated the tachycardia and he was uninducible however because we knew that there was going to be a plant uh, pulmonary valve replacement transcatheter pulmonary replacement we also um, did a circumferential ablation um, this brings me to the last uh, part of the talk, which is the role of RV resynchronization in patients with tetralogy of um, We know that uh, chronic pulmonic regurgitation uh, leads to RV dilation and dysfunction. And uh, pulmonic valve replacement could um, improve uh, this by you know, got, uh, decreasing the RV remodeling and such. So, um, and we also know that uh, patients with repaired tetralogy for low have a right bundle branch block and as a consequence have electromechanical desynchrony that can um, contribute to this RV dilation and dysfunction. So the question is, if we resynchronize, can we also remodel and, um, and improve the RV function 
um, in a way similar to the pulmonic valve uh, replacement. Um, and the study uh, from 2017 from a group in Prague looked um, just at that. So this was 2019, uh, where they looked at um, uh, patients that had a chronic pulmonic right ventricular dysfunction, and they um, resynchronized by way of placing a, um, a lead in the RV free wall. Uh, six. Uh, this study consisted of six patients, and two of them had the trial of Palu. Um, and what I found was that there was not just uh, improvement in the uh, echocardiographic parameters by way of QRS, but also there was functional improvement as well as echocardiographic parameters um, um, that improved over the course of a year. Um, so, and I should mention that the patient, um, that in this patient uh, cohort, the LV uh, systolic function was normal. Um, so this example is a perhaps a, a bit more um, sick patient um, that didn't quite fit in the in the study population that we had just seen. Um, so this lady is 58 years old and she had repaired the trilogy of Fallot and for the past year and a half she hadn't been doing pretty you know hadn't been doing well with ventricular dysfunction. Her LVF was 30 percent, her RVF was 29 percent by CMR, and she um, came in with acute decompensatory heart failure and this was not the first. Um, admission for her. Um, she had um, a IV ICD that was implanted uh, a year and a half ago, um, and she was deemed not to be a heart transplant candidate. Um, this EKG um, was found on presentation. Um, and what you can see is that her underlying rhythm is, is sinus with a normal um, or relatively normal um, AV conduction, and it's a white QRS uh, right bundle branch morphology. Um, but with the current CRT configuration, the, the QRS region was much wider. So we were, um, so the electrophysiology team was asked to evaluate for um, resynchronization, if possible. So what the chest X-ray showed was um, a, a few things. One, the R, the ICD coil, which is meant to um, be there to to um, to shock her should he, should she have VD, um, is not in an optimal position in that it's in the RVOT, and as you can see here, um, this big chunk of uh, the heart is missing. So um, if she were to have uh, BFEB or VT, um, uh, shocking her may not be uh, as easily uh, successful. And importantly, also the LV lead, which is meant to be in the posterior lateral, uh, posterior basal lateral area of the heart, um, is was in the AIV. So this was suboptimal for defibrillation and suboptimal for uh, resynchronization. So we knew we had to address the ICV lead, um, and we also had to address this, the CS lead, um, but. Based on the fact that the patient had a ripe on the branch block, uh, we felt that the CR, the, the CS lead may itself not um, be sufficient for resynchronization. And that is because, um, you know, CRT has you know, been in the guidelines, uh, is usually for patients that have a left bundle branch block where in this particular area would, uh, of the heart is where they have the latest activation. But those that have right bundle branch block, uh, the latest activation is not there. So um, we knew that we wanted to try different approaches for that. So we brought her to the electrophysiology lab um, in an attempt to uh, to test two theories. One, um, could we use the same sort of technique that the group in Prague did, where we paste the basolateral free wall, um, and can we now um, uh, you, uh, try to recruit the his uh, bundle to sort of resynchronize just um, the RV as well as you know, the, um, the LV, and therefore uh, uh, reverse the right bundle branch. Um, so in this activation map, we know that um, you know we confirmed that the latest uh, RV activation was in the basolateral wall. Um, so, we paste her simultaneously um, in the his, the basolateral um, RV wall, and um, in the appropriate CS um, um, LD position. And during ICE, I don't have the images here, but um, uh, the RV function seemed to improve, and we checked um, uh, 
a pH sat before and after, and I seem to have a modest improvement in cardiac output and index. This is a transthoracic echo uh, prior to resynchronization, and this is a transthoracic echo close to a year after resynchronization. Um, and while it's not the best image, um, uh, the LV seems to have improved. Um, it was called as a near normal from severely dysfunction. And the RV, while it was previously um, uh, considered to be moderate, uh, moderately uh, depressed, it was now mildly depressed. What I like to highlight um, is that there, there seems to be a time delay between the contraction of the, um, of the free wall and the septum uh, prior to resynchronization. And then after, it seems that the two, that the, that the two walls are now coming um, uh, together uh, in a more synchronized manner. Um, so, um, and importantly, she, uh, at, you know, a year follow-up, she has felt uh, better with regards to not having to come into the hospital with the um, decompensatory heart failure. This was the uh, the final EKG, which compared to the initial EKG, is much narrower um, and overall better. Um, and this is the final uh, lead position, uh, showing that he's leading the he's um, in the his position. Um, the uh, the lead in the free um, uh, basolateral wall of the RV, um, the CS lead in an optimal uh, position, and importantly, the ICD lead in a more optimal position for uh, appropriate fibrillation. Um, so, the take-home points from this presentation are that atrial arrhythmias in tetralogy for low patients are frequent and not entirely um, great for the patients. Um, ICDs can be life-saving for this patient population as well. QRS duration of more than 180, RV dysfunction, and um, NSVT uh, warrant an, um, a sudden cardiac death evaluation. VT ablation is uh, usually about 90% acutely effective, and the uh, role of empiric VT ablation prior to transcatheter pulmonic valve replacement um, is, uh, ought to be considered. Um, and lastly, that RV resynchronization could be as beneficial as LV uh, resynchronization. And that is Terrific. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fuentes. That was a, a whirlwind tour of a lot of important and, and very interesting um, electrophysiology techniques and, and concepts. Um, I believe it was Dr. Dave uh, who um, gave you some supervision on this so presentation, so congratulations to you and by extension to Dr. Dave for, for helping you with that. Um, we um, have a moment here, so what I'll do is I'll remind the audience if you would like to participate, ask Dr. Fuentes a question, you can go to pollev.com, uh, send a question, or you can text the word to Bakey to the phone number 37607. Either way, get us a question. Um, I'll ask you one, and then we'll go to our next speaker. Um, really a comment and then a question. So there seems to be an increasing clinical overlap between um, electrophysiology and structural heart. Um, both congenital and acquired uh, structural heart disorders. So the question would be, um, is it now time for EP training to include some formal structural heart exposure and vice versa for structural heart to have a little more EP training? Um, and I say that because in the structural heart realm, we're sort of used to, you know, EP after TAVR, need a pacemaker or not. Yeah. Um, EP before MR therapy for redu reduction of mitral regurgitation. EP at the time of TR, so is the dreaded pacemaker lead responsible? We've talked about that many times. But even now, uh, randomized clinical trials of transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement therapy are mandating EP at the beginning involved uh, in the team decision making and patient selection because of the important electrical impact uh, on the right ventricle, as you've uh, demonstrated already in your talk. So it seems like as we specialize more in cardiology, we're not coming back together again in some of these very high end enterprises. So as somebody about to embark on some EP training, it's a bit of a loaded question, but what's your view on the importance of sort of cross-pollinization with some structural stuff? And, and maybe I'll ask you again when you finish your EP <laughs> training. I would say that such um, cross-pollination should happen during general cardiology fellowship. Um, so that we have exposure not just to structural, um, to heart, but also to electrophysiology. And um, also, um, uh, put emphasis on uh, 
electrophysiology team uh, participating in uh, the multidisciplinary discussions, not just the structural heart, but also um, ACHD and heart failure patients so that we can all contribute and um, help patients. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. Uh, if we can just get you guys out of the lab and <laughs> into the meetings, so we'll make that happen. Um, okay, perfect. We're, we're doing very well on time then. So thank you, Dr. Fuentes, an excellent presentation. We may come back to you at the end for some questions, depending what, what rolls in electronically. Okay, it's my pleasure now to introduce our, our second speaker. Uh, Dr. <coughs> Tanushri Agrawal um, is also uh, finishing our cardiology uh, training program here. She attended medical school at Gandhi Medical College in India, uh, then completed her internal medicine residency right here at Houston Methodist. Uh, we were thrilled that she stayed on for cardiology fellowship training with us for the last three years. Um, and she's about to go work at St. Francis Hospital in Tulsa, uh, and they should be thrilled to have her, um, a fabulous cardiologist. Um, I'll just say that affectionately, uh, to her colleagues and to many in the intensive care setting. She's also known as the Tanushinator. Um, so I, I say that to intentionally try to embarrass her before her talk. Um, <laughs> so we're thrilled uh, that uh, Tanu is going to talk to us about tissue is the issue, novel approaches to endomyocardial biopsy. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Little. Uh, my topic for today is novel approaches for endomyocardial biopsy. Uh, this is the outline for my talk. Uh, first, I'm going to outline uh, what the conventional technique for endomyocardial biopsy is. I'm going to discuss the role uh, for this technique specifically in the, in the uh, setting of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and uh, discuss the diagnostic yield of this procedure. Uh, the second half of my talk, I'm going to focus on techniques to improve this diagnostic yield by means of modalities such as cardiac MRI, intracardiac echo and electroanatomic voltage mapping. I'm going to focus more on the voltage mapping with regard to the technique and the evidence behind it. Uh, so firstly, what is conventional endomyocardial biopsy? Uh, this is a procedure by means of which we can obtain uh, myocardial samples for tissue analysis. Uh, the right ventricle is the most commonly biopsied chamber and preferentially the interventricular septum of the right ventricle is most commonly biopsied. The free wall is usually avoided due to fear of perforation and tamponade, uh, given that the free wall is rather thin. Uh, left ventricular biopsies can be done in two ways, either via central venous access and transseptal puncture, which is usually the preferred method. Uh, the other option would be arterial access and retroaortic access into the LV, which is what you see on the right side of this image. Uh, and when I uh, refer to conventional endomyocardial biopsy, I, I'm talking about right ventricular endomyocardial biopsy with the target being the interventricular septum. Uh, there's two ways to target our biopdome towards this area. On the left side of the screen, you see an AP projection fluoroscopic view uh, with the tricuspid annulus and the interventricular septum landmarks in white. And you can see the entire course of the biopdome uh, towards the septum. On the right hand of the screen, you see an apical four-chamber view of an echocardiogram with the biopdome traversing from the right atrium into the right ventricle and being guided towards the septum. Uh, now, the jury is divided between uh, these two approaches to guide the biopdome. Really, the choice depends on operator experience and preference. Uh, one advantage of the fluoroscopic approach is, as you can see, uh, you can visualize the entire course of the biopdome uh, far better. Uh, what can go wrong? Uh, the periprocedural mortality has been reported anywhere between 0 to 0 0.07 percent. Uh, major complications that would contribute to mortality uh, are pericardial tamponade, malignant ventricular arrhythmias, high grade atrioventricular blocks, and stroke in case of left ventricular biopsies. Of course, the risk of complications varies with the patient being uh, evaluated. And for pericardial tamponade, I would highlight that native heart biopsies carry a higher risk of pe uh, tamponade compared to transplant heart biopsies. And amongst native heart biopsies, biopsies of the right ventricle are associated with a higher risk of tamponade compared to left ventricular biopsies given that the RV wall is thinner than that of the LV. Uh, now we're going to discuss the indications for conventional endomyocardial biopsy with a specific focus on non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, 
you can think of the indications for biopsy in three broad categories. Uh, the first one, the most common indication is biopsy for heart transplant recipients for the diagnosis of cardiac allograft rejection. Uh, this, like I said, this is the most common indication for this procedure and this is undoubtedly the gold standard technique for the diagnosis of rejection. This can be done either for routine surveillance or for symptom triggered evaluation. In the case of cardiac tumors, there are certain select scenarios where a biopsy would be beneficial. This would be in cases where a non-invasive diagnosis cannot be made. Now coming to non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, it is very important to elucidate the underlying etiology of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy which is really a broad umbrella term for many different specific pathologies. Uh, the reason that there is a lot of uncertainty in this regard and a lot of variation in practice due to an uncertain risk benefit ratio for these patients. So what do I mean by that? Uh, as we would do for any procedure in medicine, deciding whether a procedure is beneficial uh, requires you to weigh the risks against the benefits and in case of endomyocardial biopsies you have to ask yourself what is the anticipated diagnostic yield of this procedure what would be the prognostic value of any specific diagnosis and do you have a specific therapy to treat that particular pathology to help us navigate these complex questions in different clinical scenarios, there have been two sets of guiding documents, the first published in 2007 and a recent update in 2021. If you read these documents, the broad message is that this is a not, endomyocardial biopsy is not commonly indicated in the evaluation of heart disease. There are specific clinical scenarios where this could be useful. Uh, the first document in 2007 highlighted 14 different scenarios and the the updated version takes us through nine scenarios and I'm going to discuss these in three broad categories. Uh, in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, the presentation of uh, fulminant or acute heart failure that is suspicious for acute myocarditis uh, is a very important indication and this is actually the only class 1 indication for native heart endomyocardial biopsy according to these documents. You would typically suspect acute myocarditis when you see a combination of fulminant heart failure along with ventricular arrhythmias and high grade AV block. Here the diagnosis of giant cell myocarditis would have very different prognostic and therapeutic implications compared to a patient with lymphocytic myocarditis and I've listed some more examples on this uh, slide. In patients with subacute or chronic heart failure, the approach is a little bit different because here intelligent use of multimodality imaging such as cardiac MRI and cardiac PET scans uh, coupled with extra cardiac biopsies could eliminate the need for endomyocardial biopsy altogether. You would only think of a biopsy if these tests are non-diagnostic and clinical suspicion still remains. For for example, in the case of amyloidosis or sarcoidosis. Uh, amongst patients presenting with unexplained ventricular arrhythmias or conduction disorders, you would consider an endomyocardial biopsy specifically if you are suspecting arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy or sarcoidosis. So with, these, uh, with this background in mind, let's see what is the diagnostic yield of the conventional procedure of biopsying the right uh, ventricle, specifically the interventricular septum. This study published in 2013 from the John Hopkins Hospital was a retrospective study spanning a decade from 2000 to 2009. Uh, they evaluated 851 patients who underwent the standard biopsy for evaluation of unexplained heart failure. Uh, these patients underwent right ventricular biopsies like I mentioned. A specific diagnostic result was obtained in 25.5% of the biopsies and this changed the re uh, treatment strategy in 22.6% of patients. Uh, the rate of major complications was very low as you can see on the screen with 0.008% of patients having uh, perforation and tamponade. Uh, only one patient had VFib cardiac arrest, all were res uh, successfully resuscitated with no deaths reported. Uh, I'd like to point out that this study did not include any data on cardiac MRI. Uh, this study led many to believe that this is essentially a low risk and low yield procedure. So does this really help our patients? Here I'd like to point out that uh, the, di the diagnostic yield of a biopsy really depends on whether you're dealing with diffuse pathology or you're dealing with focal, patchy, segmental pathology. Uh, 
uh, it makes intuitive sense that diseases with a diffuse distribution would have a higher diagnostic yield, for example, giant cell myocarditis and amyloidosis. On the right side of the screen, I've listed some examples for diseases with patchy distribution and as you can see, the sensitivity there is much lower. But is this the best we can do or do we have any tools to improve uh, these numbers? So here I'd like to introduce the concept of targeted biopsy techniques by means of which we can identify disease tissue and selectively biopsy those areas. Uh, first, I'd like to discuss cardiac MRI. Uh, as you know, cardiac MRI has the unique ability to allow tissue characterization uh, with techniques such as late gadolinium enhancement or T2 mapping, which can help us non-invasively identify tissue edema, infiltration, inflammation, and scar. So can we use this to guide the bioptome? Uh, this study published in 2010 uh, was a retrospective study from Germany where they evaluated 755 patients who underwent native heart biopsies. The most common clinical indication was suspected myocarditis and the other was suspected infiltrative cardiomyopathy. Uh, so the, the technique described in this particular study was that the biopsy site was chosen based on the area of late gadolinium enhancement. However, this was not as selective as you would think. Uh, the operators biopsied the ventricle that showed late gadolinium enhancement, but they did not selectively biopsy the same areas or segments that were involved. Uh, amongst the 292 patients who had biventricular biopsies, they concluded that late gadolinium enhancement did not help improve the diagnostic yield. Uh, but again, I'd like to remind you that these were not as selective as you would think. Uh, intracardiac echo is a technique by means of which you could uh, pass an echocardiographic catheter uh, uh, into the chamber of interest for uh, visualization from within the heart. Uh, the, the use of this has been reported and is widely used for biopsies of intracardiac masses. Uh, what you can see on the top left side of the screen is an ice image with the catheter located in the right atrium. So towards the top of the screen is the right atrium. Here is the tricuspid valve and to the bottom of the screen is the right ventricle. You can see here a mass sitting at the junction of the right atrium and the right ventricle very close to the tricuspid valve. On the right side of the screen, you can see this bioptome being guided towards the tip of the mass and nicely avoiding the tricuspid valve apparatus. In the uh, specific situation of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, eyes could potentially be helpful by looking at the echogenicity of tissue and potentially identifying disease tissue from within the chamber. Uh, this has not been formally reported, but it is widely used as a supplement to voltage-guided biopsies, which I'm going to uh, come to shortly. Uh, now I'm going to focus on voltage-guided biopsies for the rest of my talk. First, let me introduce the technique. Uh, this involves a couple of steps. The first step involves creating a 3D anatomic map of the chamber of interest, acquiring electrogram signals. We then superimpose these to create what we call a voltage map and finally biopsy. So what do we mean by anatomic mapping? Uh, so the patient uh, on the cath lab table is actually uh, on a locator pad. So this is what a locator pad looks like. It is placed underneath the table. It has three magnetic coils embedded within it with each coil emitting magnetic fields of varying strengths. What you see here is the mapping catheter which is passed into the chamber of interest. As you can see it has several splines to increase the surface area of contact and this is sort of like a GPS within the heart. This has magnetic sensors that can actually localize the location of the catheter to very precisely in three-dimensional uh, space. The end result looks something like this. This is a right anterior oblique projection and what f looks like essentially a shell of the chamber from within the heart. What the software does is it maps every single point that the catheter touches and creates a shell-like appearance to give us a road map for the next step. Uh, this is the right ventricle. What you see here is the RV apex. Uh, this is the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava and the right atrium. Our next step is to obtain uh, electrogram signals. This same catheter is equipped with electrodes at its tips to help us acquire local voltage signals. Uh, here it, it's important to review the hallmarks of what a disease tissue signal looks like. In panel A, here you see what a normal electrogram signal looks like. 
On the other hand, diseased uh, tissue typically has a signal that is delayed, prolonged and of low voltage as you can see in panels B and C. Uh, we assign a color code based on the exact voltage that we obtain and then map it onto the anatomic uh, 3D model that we created. The end result looks something like this. Uh, this is a, again a right ventricle in an RAO oblique projection. So to orient you first, what you see here is the apex of the right ventricle. This is the tricuspid annulus and the inflow and towards this side is the RVOT. Uh, as you can see on the left side, we have a scale here with purple representing healthy tissue. So what we consider as normal voltage, red representing very low voltage, which is likely scar and all the colors in between represent voltages in this range and probably represent a diseased tissue. Similarly, this is a uh, right anterior oblique projection of the left ventricle with this being the apex. Again, pink represents healthy tissue, red represents scar tissue and the uh, colors in between represent areas of disease. So, as you can see from these images, with this type of localization of disease tissue, this would help us select biopsy sites. One important caveat to remember when you are interpreting these signals is uh, to understand the difference between bipolar and unipolar signals. Uh, these would essentially have different thresholds of what is considered normal and abnormal voltage. Bipolar electrograms have good visualization of subendocardial signals, whereas unipolar electrograms would be far superior for far field that is subepicardial signals. Uh, we need to make sure that low voltage is not due to lack of catheter contact. The way we can do this is by looking directly on fluoroscopy, uh, using the ice catheter to look at the tissue contact and also by using contact force sensors embedded within the catheter. Uh, like I said, uh, ICE here has a supplementary role, ensuring tissue contact allows us to look at the health of the sampling area, avoid critical structures such as the valve apparatus and also monitor in real time for the development of pericardial effusion or thrombus on the sheath. Once we've selected the site of biopsy, the mapping catheter is then exchanged for a steerable sheath and a bioptome. So what you see here is a fluoroscopic projection and this is a catheter traversing via transeptal access into the left ventricle. Uh, this steerable sheath can be directed in multiple directions, but the bioptome is not steerable. The bioptome goes to where the sheath directs it. Here, it is being directed towards the lateral wall of the left ventricle to obtain a biopsy. Some limitations of this technique, uh, like I said, we are limited in our ability to uh, navigate the bioptome. Uh, this technique adds costs and procedural time to the procedure and of course it is limited to centers of excellence. I would like to illustrate the use of this technique with, a, with an example. This was a patient who uh, presented to our hospital with complete heart block. This was a 42 year old lady with complete heart block. Her cardiac MRI showed grossly normal biventricular size and function and it was notable for the presence of extensive late gadolinium enhancement in the free wall of the left ventricle, the free wall of the right ventricle. During an EP study, she was found to have inducible monomorphic VT, so she underwent implantation of a dual chamber ICD. She underwent a coronary angiogram which ruled out significant epicardial coronary artery stenosis. Due to the suspicion for cardiac sarcoidosis, she had a contrast chest CT which showed no evidence of uh, any uh, abnormalities and she underwent a conventional endomyocardial biopsy which showed no specific pathology. Unfortunately, she presented a few months later with multiple ICD shocks in the setting of monomorphic VT and therefore a decision was made to proceed with VT ablation and a voltage guided endomyocardial biopsy. So this is what the result of her voltage mapping from the left ventricle looked like. Uh, so to orient you, this is a RAO view of the left ventricle. Here you see the apex of the left ventricle at the 5 o'clock position. At the 11 o'clock position, what you see is the LVOT uh, and the pink tissue represents healthy tissue, the red represents dead or scar tissue and everything in between is probably diseased. Uh, so this is a very abnormal uh, voltage map, typically it would look all pink. Uh, so based on this, uh, this area was chosen for the biopsy site in the LVOT and based on the findings from the cardiac MRI, the LV lateral wall was also biopsied. Uh, she also underwent uh, VT ablation 
and uh, the biopsy clinched the histologic diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis. She was initiated on immunosuppressive therapy. She now remains free of heart failure and VT. Uh, so is this, uh, uh, does this technique really work or is it uh, limited to isolated case reports? Let us review the evidence behind it. Uh, this publication uh, was the first to prove that the, the technique works. Uh, the authors used 31 patients, uh, studied 31 patients who had borderline criteria for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Amongst the 20 patients who had abnormal mapping signals, they found that the areas of low voltage had very strong correlation with my myocyte loss as well as fibro fatty replacement on histopathology. This study published in 2020 is the largest single center retrospective study published to date uh, you, uh, that analyzed the diagnostic accuracy of voltage guided biopsies. Uh, they studied 162 patients over a decade from 2010 to 2019. Uh, the operators were required to document the suspected clinical diagnosis before they proceeded with the biopsy. The most common indications were arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and myocarditis. Patients also underwent cardiac MRI and 70% of patients were found to have abnormal late gadolinium enhancement. Uh, amongst the, uh, all the patients underwent voltage guided biopsy and 61% were found to have abnormal low voltage uh, signals. Uh, so the way they selected the biopsy sites was based on abnormalities noted on cardiac MRI, on voltage mapping or on intracardiac echo. Amongst the few patients who were triple negative on all of these different modalities, they did a standard biopsy from the interventricular septum. Uh, they demonstrated excellent safety of the procedure. As you can see, there were only three patients who had vascular access complications. These were managed conservatively. One patient had a small pericardial effusion and no deaths were reported. So it's definitely safe, but how diagnostic was the procedure? So here you see a table outlining the sensitivity and specificity with regard to the final histopathologic diagnosis. So areas that showed abnormality on MRI with regard to late gadolinium enhancement had very high sensitivity of 77% and voltage mapping had a similar sensitivity of 74%. Here although it looks like voltage mapping had higher specificity, this difference was not diagnostically, uh, statistically significant. So in a sense, they concluded that these two modalities had similar diagnostic accuracy. The best diagnostic accuracy was obtained when using a combination of both MRI and voltage mapping. As you can see, the pool sensitivity being 95% and the pool specificity being 83%. And these numbers are far better than what was historically reported in the uh, patients who underwent conventional biopsies. Here is a Sankey diagram uh, that shows on the left side what the, the suspected diagnosis was before the patient underwent the procedure and what you see on the right side are the numbers with regard to the final histopathologic diagnosis. And I think this image represents what's most clinically important and you can see so many patients crossing over into different final diagnoses and there was reclassification of the diagnosis in 39% of patients. Here at Houston Methodist, we have employed this technique in selected patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy where clinical features, cardiac MRI or FDG PET are suggestive of focal pathology. In a period from 2016 to 2020, we have employed this technique for 31 patients to date and we are evaluating the diagnostic utility of these various modalities in reaching a final diagnosis. Uh, there are many more exciting uh, developments uh, uh, in this arena. I haven't discussed the role of FDG PET, uh, but this is a modality that could point to areas of active inflammation. It has not been formally explored in the setting of cardiac biopsies, but it would be a promising uh, tool here. Uh, and like I discussed the limitations of the bioptome with the lack of ability to steer it to specific areas, but a recent publication in Nature actually uh, introduced a microbiotome which has steering capabilities. And lastly, uh, it is also very important uh, to discuss what we do with the uh, with the samples that we obtain. Uh, gene expression profiling allows us to study the mRNA signatures of the tissue and could enhance our sampling uh, analysis. Uh, 
So I'd like to conclude by saying that conventional endomyocardial biopsy has limited sensitivity for patchy myocardial disease and you targeted biopsies by using multimodality imaging and electroanatomic voltage mapping may help us increase the diagnostic utility of this procedure. I'd like to thank Dr. Bhimraj, Dr. Dave, Dr. Talmasani and Dr. Flott for helping me prepare this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agarwal. Appreciate that very much. That was very interesting. Um, again, uh, encourage some questions or comments through the electronic means, and that should be flashed upon your screen. Um, while waiting for that, I have a question. So, a couple of questions. Since you, you know, clearly read extensively in the in the literature uh, around biopsies, both endomyocardial and intracardiac masses. Have you seen anything about use of echo-based strain to identify regional abnormalities? I'm imagining, and I haven't seen it, um, if the, you know, if the, if the um, details were good enough on a strain map and you could see abnormalities in certain walls, might that guide a, a biopsy to that location? Has that been described at all? I think that's a great question. I have not come across any evidence for the use of this technique, uh, but I can certainly see uh, how useful this would be uh, because it could help, lo it, it could be a poor man's cardiac MRI where it's not available mm -hmm. that could help us <laughs> characterize the tissue. I'm just crying a little bit, the notion that echo is a poor man's <laughs> MRI. I, I, I accept it from you for now, but we'll talk about that later. Um, another question. So the other area, again, you know, we, uh, Dr. Fuentes, and we, we talked a few minutes ago about the intersection of different fields within uh, cardiology, and, and it's, it's common in engineering and other, other realms of, of advance that the intersection of other fields are where the most exciting things happen. So again, uh, in the all-important interventional world, um, there's this notion of uh, electro catheter-based electrosurgery, and we're using catheters with electrified wires to do procedures like the basilica to split the aortic valve, uh, lampoon, reverse lampoon to split the, the mitral valve leaflets. But conceivably, you could grab an abnormal left-sided tissue and then do some sort of electrocardery and pull it out without having to. Uh, uh, do surgery, not a, a myocardial biopsy phenomenon, but certainly a mass access. Um, I know there have been a few case reports of that sort of attempt. Um, the other thing I'll just comment on is the use of 3D echo is an important advance compared to the historic 2D guided biopsies, even at Houston Methodist. We've had experience early guiding biopsies with 2D and always difficult to know which plane you're in with the bioptome, but adding biplane or 3D gives you a little more fidelity and perhaps there's opportunity there because I know uh, the interventional echo group has not been overly involved in these, in these procedures simply because we believe we have other good options. But from your presentation, it's got my wheels turning that maybe we should be a little more involved uh, in supporting those procedures and just seeing what is the incremental value of biplane and, and real-time 3D imaging. Absolutely. Thank you for the comment. And I, I completely agree that uh, as we develop more and more sophisticated tools, I think it calls for all of us to come together to help our patients in multidisciplinary teams. Uh, my final question is, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, do they already have a biopsy expert or are they about to get one? <laughs> I think I'll find out soon. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, well, if there are no further questions, um, it's Dr. Lumsden calling in, but I don't think it's a question. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, we'll wrap this up for this morning. Uh, we'll thank Dr. Fuentes and Dr. Agrawal for these phenomenal presentations. Congratulations to you both for you. your first Grand Rounds presentation, at least at Houston Methodist. We expect you both to be coming back in a few years and doing this again. Um, uh, best of luck in your new careers in EP and, and in Tulsa, and we know we'll see you both again. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.